Soon after his companions fled south to Vesh, Grecus ventured into the Eclavian Expanse with the druid Sayana Summergale in search of the rift that the Kibli's army had used to attack Corvea. Deep within the place known as the Glutton Wood, they found it, a gash in the fabric of the plains themselves. The Eladrin's strange upbringing had given him the unique ability to see the threads of this magical firmament, where others of his kind simply ignored it. Weaving together the individual pieces, the wizard was able to seal the portal like a skilled surgeon, leaving only a faint aura in its wake. Unfortunately, Grecus and Sayana also found something far grislier. The missing druids of Glimmer Lake, several of whom had fallen prey to some manner of vile aberration. Narrowly surviving this encounter, the wizard returned to Brindle Keep a hero, but found himself drawn further and further into Cabarix's research. The shifting stars, the planar rifts, the strange white worms, even the fall of Valandor. It was all connected, somehow. Grecus returned to the broken tower seeking answers, but found none. Bidding his mentor, Rory Chateur, farewell once again, he disappeared into the Eclavian Expanse. Cora Hale came to find her every waking moment haunted by the black dragon Bochaladax. Hoping to find answers and a means to get the monster out of her head, the Shifter returned to the Feywild to reconnect with her people and learn their ancient ways. She found the disparate packs of the Great Veil vale, united under the Kevalesti, and Dalwyn, who had mentored Kor in the ways of the Lycanthrop upon her last trip, became a true teacher to her. Under Dalwyn's tutelage, the Barbarian would walk the path of the Berserker from there on. Her mood became a tumultuous thing, shifting like leaves in a storm as her body became a vessel for all the many primal spirits around her. Although legends already spoke of Korra as the first dragon slayer in a generation, and as the hero of Brintle Keep, tales slowly began to circulate of a spirit who lived in the shape of a shifter woman, and was said to take on the form of any beast as easily as a man wore his cloak. After many carefully chosen words and a bit of a change in management, Chadwick Malatesta left the Ale Hall Illworks as its new owner. The tiefling returned to the surface world a richer man, but continued on in his quest to uncover the secret of resurrecting his family. For his services, the Whispering God, Vecna, gifted the cleric with the ability to speak to the dead themselves, and to draw out their dark knowledge. Chadwick used this newfound power to his advantage time and time again, gathering many secrets lost to the ancients for his shadowy benefactor. Conspiracies began to unravel before the tiefling's eyes as he did, especially when he learned more of Lord Rokesh Dar's backdoor dealings and of his bid for greater power in the city of Vesh. Chadwick became adept at plucking the different strings of this web to get what he wanted, and soon, the Malatesta Wine Empire began to rise once again to the fore. Kalam Lunit returned to Vesh to find the Togakure clan in even more dire straits than when he had left. Forced into negotiations with the local kidnappers, the ninjas were subsumed into the criminal consortium known as the Seers of Sarmuz. The assassin was surprised to find more jobs coming his way than ever before but was not pleased that he was given a smaller cut for each one. However, he easily made up for the lost money with the contracts that he had negotiated with people like Lord Dawn. When Kakatok, the mysterious leader of the Seers, learned of this, however, Ka had a bounty placed on his own head. One does not simply kill a professional killer, though, and the assassin found great success afterwards as a freelancer skillfully evading any would-be bounty hunters. Although Vecna had saved his and Korra's lives from mummy rot, Ka found his footsteps dogged by the gods' machinations. He would eventually travel through the Shadowfell into the strange worlds beyond the astral plane, seeking the enigmatic lord of the spider throne.
Dazzler quickly got to work on his and Winnebelt's entry for the great art contest being held as part of Vesh's heptacentennial. He found himself approached soon after by none other than the Fly, Lord Rokesh Dar. The Merchant Prince sought to become the Bard's sponsor for the event, and possibly his full-time patron in the future. Although Dazzler was cautious in dealing with Dar, due to the warning given to him by a future version of Jarlton that he had run across, the Bard was finally talked into accepting the Fly's offer. Two weeks later, the Half-Elf was rolling in gold. The fame and fortune he had always sought came to him as every noble and merchant in Vesh came, seeking to commission ballads from the man with the auto loot. The world opened up before him in ways he had never known, and happiness filled his life as he found new adventures alongside not only the Sixteen Rapiers, but Winnebelf as well. Yet Dazzler still found questions gnawing at the back of his mind, questions of his lost heritage and of the origins of his strange powers. Always looking to help others, Cosmodius continued his benevolent, if a bit extreme, acts throughout Vesh. With the flesh merchants busy fighting one another, and the infamous gangster, Krumnith Tarnishgrin, gone, all the people of the city, rich and poor alike, found themselves enjoying lives of relative safety for some time afterwards. However, the void that was left in the criminal underworld by the Deva's actions was quickly filled by the infamous Seers of Sarmuz. Cosmodius' ability to change the lives of others seemed to awaken something inside of him, as the sorcerer found himself experiencing increasingly vivid memories of his past lives. Bringing the information he had gleaned from the Vecnite Shrine to his friend, Dagrin Doomstone, Cosmodius began to learn more about his absent god, Celestian, and the mysterious astronomical occurrences over the Eclavian Expanse 100 years past. He left, soon after, a trail of good deeds in his wake, seeking a way to the one known as Agath of Thrush. Mara Wolfwyn, known to many simply as the Wolf, found her journey into the Underdark more fruitful than she had hoped. The Blackguard was contacted by a powerful warlock who claimed to know more about the magical suit of armor that she had claimed from the body of an assassin two years ago. Acting cautiously on this information, she eventually met with the elusive sorcerer, who told her that, bound within the armor, was a mighty fiend from the lower plains named Amon. Through careful research and testing, Mara found her powers multiplied tenfold as her command over the armor increased. New tales of the wolf's ruthless efficiency spread throughout the land surrounding Vesh, drawing all manner of attention to the mysterious mercenary. As Mara's relationship with the devil Amon evolved, she began to understand its whispers, especially those that spoke of a solid link between her refusal to marry Armand Mir and the attempt on her life. Shakir had gone from a simple cobalt waiter at the Burping Boulet to a brave warrior with a real armor and a, a real sword. He continued his adventures as one of the 16 rapiers for a long time until eventually settling down and using his experience to train others. Thanks to King Brendan III's reforms, he even went on to become an instructor at the Royal Corvean Institute in Soldovar. Despite it all, though, Shakir remained good friends with Dazzler, and it it wasn't uncommon to find the kobold visiting the bard, shoving some of uh, Winnebelt's delicious treats into his mouth. The gnomish inventor, Jarlton Culperanius, would go on to excel in many fields, finally proving those who had derided his ideas for so long wrong. Even as his fame and workload increased, Jarlton continued to help the Sixteen Rapiers in their varied adventures, always providing some a tidbit of knowledge or manner of contraption that any situation called for. Uh, always with a catchy acronym, of course. The brilliant Tinker pushed the limits of what was and what could be further than anyone before. Perhaps further than anyone should have. Mazek, the Goblin Gangster owed Kalam Lunit a life debt for rescuing him in the Feywild, and then put his neck on the line, not once, but twice for the assassin. 
First, by foiling Jib Marook's little smuggling operation at Brintle Keep, and then by spying on his old employers, the Seers of Samus and Vesh. But hey, he paid well. Unfortunately, no slight goes unseen by Kakatov, and no slight goes unpunished by Kakatov. Marzek woke up one day to find himself miles from home on a slave ship to the war-torn land of Alasia. Winnevelt Synthalos, the former junior counselor of Selindahel, was very happy with Dazzler and shared in the prize they won at the Veshen Art Contest. She baked an enormous cake in celebration, having to use one of Lord Dar's industrial furnaces to even cook the thing. Winnevelt continued to grow ever fonder for half-elf lover after that. Some would say even to her own detriment at times. But something in her mind always told her that he was the one. Something she had known ever since their first kiss in the Feywild. Elatha would continue to train under Ka in the ways of the assassin for many years, slowly learning each skill step by step. Her father, who had loved her well, became a faint memory of her childhood, almost as faded as that of her mother who died when Aletha was but an infant. The girl would make her first kill at nine, and take her first solo contract at eleven. Death was already mundane to her, but it was not until she felt the rush that came with murder that she truly understood. This is what she was born to do. Being a hedge knight, Sir Falero usually never stayed anywhere too long. Always in search of good coin, good booze, and beautiful ladies. Lucky for him, the 16 rapiers and a small intestine provided that, and a whole lot more. He often boasted in towering the brothels of knowing the mighty Korra and the kind Cosmodius. But drawing that kind of attention to yourself isn't always a good thing. Indeed, one night he found himself cornered by a few thugs on the docks and stabbed to the hells and back before falling into the blood-soaked water. Talk about bogus. But some say he found a bodacious merbabe waiting for him beneath the waves. The elf maiden, Amarnel, had lost her very soul to the vile flesh merchants of the Seth, but it was through the bravery of her friends that she was rescued from an eternity of suffering within the belly of a devourer. Her father, Anarisa Sanyana, took her disembodied spirit and ventured to distant lands in hopes that someday. He could save her, that he wouldn't fail those that he loved again, as he had his Aliata, his wife, and very nearly his son. Who can say what happened to her in the end, only that the blood of the Narasas and Yana lived on. The blood-eyed cat of security lived a long and happy life in the care of Dazzler and Winnebelt. She seemed to live for an extraordinary amount of time for a cat, but then she was an extraordinary cat, wasn't she? Erstrigi, the owlbear cub, grew strong as the years passed, and thanks to Ka's training, just a bit stealthier than the average specimen. She never grew as big as some, perhaps due to the torture she had endured when she was young, but Ugi found true comfort and security in the assassin's care. Bonezone continued on in his mechanical existence. Although the mountain-dwelling mutt had been lost to the nightmarish tree buried within Andorgiax's temple, Jarltan's recreation brought a smile to the face of all those who heard its distinctive bark. 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 The sturge that Chadwick had sent after Botchera so long ago had found a new home in the Sinking Sanctum. Its nest grew exponentially from there, and the massive, blood-sucking sturge swarms of the tar marsh became the stuff of legends. The rock that the party had absconded with after their victory over Lady Esteru, atop the Shadowfell Citadel of the Flesh Merchants, continued to serve as a mount for the Sixteen Rapiers in a small intestine. More than once, its presence in such civilized lands caused them grief with locals, as the creature's enormous appetite did not distinguish between wild and domesticated beasts. Never sure whether it should answer to the name Mark or Duane, the rock itself lived a confused existence, wondering how the silver-tongued Dazzler had convinced it to join them in the first place. Soon after the Sixteen Rapiers set out for Kulfsgate, Rokeshdar sent forces north to aid the ailing border fort of Brintle Keep, quickly re-establishing order in the region. The Veshans found the Kibbeli's host easy pickings, 
as the invaders had not only been scattered by their failed assault on the fortress, but had also been decimated by a mysterious disease at Glimmer Lake, and cut off from their supply lines when the portal they had used was shut behind them. Rebuilding began immediately, thanks to the efforts organized by Gregus and the priestess Serenity, who oversaw the slow return of refugees to the abandoned borderlands. Bandit activity remained high, however, with Botcher's lieutenant, the knoll known as Yik, being the chief perpetrator. The lizard folk of Boiling Bog also proved troublesome in the months and years that followed, some of them seeing the explosion that swallowed Kelver's Crossing as a sign from their gods, the Genuiri, that they should drive out the warmbloods from their ancestral lands. Despite being free from under the shadow of one arc, Brintle Keep now fell under that of another. As the Corvean heartlands squabbled over King Brynodin III's sweeping reforms, Vesh asserted its control over the Eclavian marches. Lord Saverin Brintle, being an easily persuaded man, was kept on under Lord Dar's command, much to the chagrin of his wife, the Lady Tanika, who packed up in the middle of the night and returned to her family in Grumet soon after. If Vesh had owned the trade roads and everything but name before, it now had its icon emblazoned on every stone. The Holy Kingdom of Corvea was weakened by the loss of the Eclavian marches, and the stunning reforms introduced by King Brynden III did not help the wounded nation find stability. Signing a writ that officially allowed those belonging to races generally considered monstrous or evil by the common folk to enter the royal service, the king alienated many of his people, especially the more traditionalist noble families, who feared what this might bring. But the idolistic king ensured them that Pelor's light shied down upon all mortal creatures, and that what he did was by the will of the Sun Father. A terrible string of civil wars followed, and though people like Commander Maltravicus tried to maintain order, the great kingdom of the Sun shattered under the pressure. Vesh, which had been a protectorate of Corvea for many years, broke away, once again becoming a wholly independent city-state, as it had been in the days of Valandor. The tribes of the Great Forest retreated back to their lands and barred them from all outsiders, whispering of hideous mutants and of ancient prophecies. The leader of the Corvean opposition, Lord Roderick Mir, founded his own kingdom in the south, but met powerful resistance in the form of a great warrior encased in a suit of armor shaped like a wolf, and a tiefling orphan bearing the last name of his ancient rivals, Malatesta. The summer court convened in the Feywild to tackle the growing danger posed by the bleaching, which still swept through the mystical lands completely unimpeded. Eladrin gathered from every corner of the plains to find a solution. But it was then that more terrible news came to them. Selindahel had fallen. The lycanthropes of the Great Vale had been forged into a single pack by Dalwyn of the Kevalesti, and led beyond the Wolfsbane border, taking the city within the mists completely by surprise. As if by design, the great elven court split in disagreement. Even the great Queen Titania and her erstwhile consort, Oberon, found themselves on opposite sides of the debate, though some, like Celiara of the great house Sulin, urged concentration on the greater threat, their calls were drowned out by other, louder voices, which called for the extermination of the beast folk, or rebuked those who had such genocidal notions. Yet, in some far-off place, wine glasses clinked in celebration, a six-fingered hand raising the liquid to smiling lips. Mere days after the sixteen rapiers sailed for Kalfsgate, riots broke out in the poorer, smokeward districts of Vesh. Corvean refugees, their passions stoked by mysterious preachers, turned on goblinoids and other supposedly monstrous races living there, dragging them into the streets and burning their homes. Rokeshdar's remaining men did their best to protect orphanages and tiefling-owned businesses, but their efforts were far from comprehensive. Many tried to flee this ravenous lynch mob, only to find the gates of the district shut, the city guards nowhere to be seen atop the walls. Despite all, the city of Vesh continued on as it always had, under the leadership of the Invisible Hand, as well as the various merchant princes. However, something had changed. 
although the streets still bristled with people, and the harbors still filled to the brim, the place seemed almost serene. The destruction and terror wrought by the riots, the Kibli's invaders, Mulciberon and his fire elementals, the flesh merchants of Isev, all of it seemed so small, so easy to fix for some reason. The city between found an equilibrium that it had not known since its founding over 700 years before, and it was all thanks to a simple band of adventurers. It was all thanks to the sixteen rapiers and a small intestine.